So before we jump into the word, let's pray. Lord, thanks for this morning. Thank you for uh, this gift that you've given us of unity in you. This fellowship, Father, that we can't, we can't make this happen. This is something that you're doing. And, and Lord, uh, you know, I, we, many of us, uh, worship you throughout the week. You know, maybe we have time in your, in your word with you. and Maybe time at the foot of our bed praying with you. Uh, Lord, and those times are extremely special. But, Father, this morning there's something special about your saints, your people gathering together and worshiping you. And then being encouraged in your word. So we thank you for this gift that you've given us this morning of uh, a relationship with you and fellowship with other brothers and sisters. And so, Lord, you know the text that we're reading this morning, Father, you know it better than anyone. And so, Father, we pray that when we read the text that we would rightly divide it this morning, that you would rightly divide it in our hearts and minds, that we wouldn't misrepresent what you're saying, that we wouldn't twist something out of context, Father, but that we would glean that we would grow, that we would be equipped, Father, and we would continue to be transformed by the renewing of our mind to be more and more like Jesus, the way. So, Father, we open our hearts to your word this morning and open your word, open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name, we said, amen. amen. All right, Romans chapter 1. Extremely referenced, can be uh, misused often as with any passage in the Bible. We're going to be finishing up chapter 1. Steve launched us into Romans 1 and gave us an excellent summary of the surroundings of what Paul was going through and how God was um, unfolding the vision that he had for his life and the love for people and to proclaim the gospel encourage you if you'd like some more background on Romans to listen to last week's very informative and a blessing indeed so starting in verse 18 I'm in the New King James Version it says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because all they knew, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor will thank for but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. We're going to be in some extremely challenging um, portions of scripture today. And I, we're, I'm going to even going to add to it with more challenging parts of scripture. But I think that if you will sit down and dine with us for the whole meal that God has prepared, uh, I don't think anyone in here would leave without a blessing this morning. So, Imagine a beautiful picture of nature. Perhaps you've had one in your house since growing up. Um, um, perhaps it's one of something local that you've seen before. Pilot Mountain. A, a beautiful painting, right? One that you enjoy looking at. And it's without blemish here, right? It looks just the way it should look. What often happens God makes something right that he has put together just the way he wanted it and we decide to add to it God has given it to us like this and we say oh well what about this I don't know perhaps what about if we add one more, if we add one more thing to the picture.
Doesn't it look great? I've added a little bit of my flavor to it. We can do more. We can make it even prettier. It's okay if they fall off. perfect. If you're listening to this, we have a painting up here of a local scene, and I've just placed some uh, sticky notes on the picture, and the Lord took them off. All right? So we add, and we say that it's okay if I put this on the picture. It's okay if I add in something else to the creation. And we staunchly advocate for those adjustments that we've made to the creation that God has given us. Some would say it's majestic looking at a beautiful painting of nature or perhaps even the real thing. I've seen some pictures this morning of some people's view from their driveways or on the way to fellowship this morning and some of them are stunning. I know when you go on your favorite vacations, perhaps to the mountains or the beach, if you enjoy that more, you take pictures and you remember that scene even, even right now, how beautiful it is. And it is indeed, the, the Bible talks about that. Psalm 19, one through six says, uh, for the choir director, a Psalm of David, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. Often God has given us a beautiful picture, perhaps a real thing. He's given us creation. And we say, well, what about this? Or what about this? And then we justify what we've added to the creation, the painting, the picture. I'm just going to get to the point this morning, and we're going to stay with it all the way through till we say amen. What happens with um, God and ourselves and him making you uniquely and specifically the way you are, special, none like you. There's no DNA like your DNA. There's no DA like this DA. <laughs> and so then I'm saying, well, what's wrong with a little smoke? What's wrong with this little marijuana? Right? Yeah, I know I went from here to there quickly. Or what's wrong with just a couple pills to make me feel better every morning and afternoon? What about a little porn in my life? A little escape, a little alcohol every day, perhaps some violence. See who we can go stir up, see how we can bully someone. You see these things, just say it with me, think about it, don't say it out loud. Marijuana, abuse, pill, abuse, alcohol, abuse, porn, violence. These things are not natural. It's like sticky notes over the top of a painting. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. It's clear that it doesn't fit. 
Everyone around you can see that there's something. What's interesting is, if you go back to verse 18, people say, God is so angry at us. Read verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Look, 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 look what it says there. The unrighteousness is what's being judged. The ungodliness is what's, what God is dealing with. And some would say, well, God just hates me because I'm struggling with this thing or I'm stumbling with this thing. That's not what the scripture says. The, script, the Bible clearly says that he is dealing with this unrighteousness or this ungodliness. And that's a church word, right? Unrighteousness and ungodliness. Let, let's read, so let's change it. He, he's dealing with that which doesn't belong in the perfect creation that he made. You, you see, he made it the way he wanted it. And he made it best. Who in here would agree that adding a sticky note over the top of the painting makes the painting better? No one, right? It doesn't matter how pretty of a smiley face I'll draw over the sticky note. Now, if my kids made it, it's amazing. But it doesn't add, it takes away from the painting. And so God isn't judging us because of necessarily just us being who we are. He's judging the sin. He's dealing with the unrighteousness and ungodliness. And it's important that we don't confuse the two. Look, here's another important thing. It says in verse 18, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We can put so many sticky notes over the painting that we begin to communicate around to the people that were the to communicate to the people around us. Well, this is what it's supposed to be. It has sticky notes all over it. Like Everyone can see if we give it, you know, sometimes we don't like to be honest, right? We're over diplomatic sometimes. But everyone can see, wait a minute, dude, you got, there's something on top of the creation that doesn't go with the creation. And what happens is sometimes when I get addicted to something or I find myself stuck in something that is inappropriate, that God doesn't want me to be involved with, I begin to say, no, no, this is what it is. This is how I'm made. And try to, and attempt to suppress the reality of what the true existence is. So that's what's happening here. Man is, God gave man, he, he made creation. We are a part of that creation. You're a created being, right? And then we put these other things on top of it because we desire it or like it or for whatever reason it's sin and then we we suppress the truth and we say or some say no th this is what it really is no this is what it is when we know that it's not listen to this second king 715 1715 second king 1715 the notes are always uploaded to the teachings they rejected his statutes and his covenant, which he made with their fathers, and his warnings, which he gave them. Not only did they reject the statutes, but then they rejected the warnings, right, which he gave them. And they followed idols and became empty and followed the nations that surrounded them about which the Lord had commanded them not to do as they did. They begin to look around the people around them like, oh, well, that's cool. We can do that. It's okay to do this. Where was I? Yesterday I was mowing the grass in the backyard. I got a little lost in the worship, right? So here I am mowing, you know, sometimes I think I'm on a racetrack racing around the fire pit. Sometimes I get lost with Jesus. And this was one of those moments. And I'm like, I start praising the Lord. Like, oh, 
oh, you know, I'm praising. I got headphones in, mower's wide open, nobody can hear me. And then I looked and there was people off in the distance looking at me. <laughs> and what did I do? I stopped worshiping. I put my hands down, act like I had some sense <laughs> in the moment. And I was like, look at that peer pressure. Now, I, there's times where, you know, we should be alone and private and meek, you know. But I was just thinking about how the world so often now, uh, the ways of the world that are contrary to God has become so enforceful that they now have peer pressured us many times into not worshiping our king. Think about creation for a minute. It's pretty cool. You might like this. The sun is how many miles away? 93 million. All right, 93 million miles away. That's how far the sun is from the earth. 93 million miles away. How far is the closest star? 4.2 light years. The sun is 93 million miles away. And according to some places on the internet, <laughs> the closest star is four light years away. Now think about this for a minute. The thickness of a sheet of paper, not this way, not standing up tall way, but flat, the thickness of a sheet of paper. If this represents 93 million miles, it would take a stack 31 feet tall to represent how far away the closest star is. Each one of these representing 93 million miles. Think about this. One light year is six trillion miles away. One light year is equal to six trillion miles. If we are in a space shuttle going five miles per second, all right, five miles per second, it would take us 37,000 years to travel one light year. If we were in a space shuttle and we we're gonna drive one light year, okay, it would take us humans 37,000 years driving in a space shuttle to go one light year. It would take us 148,000 years to reach, us, reach the nearest star in a space shuttle. 148,000 years. Our group of planets, the Milky Way, is approximately, I don't know how they figure this out, what telescope does this, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years wide. So we went from 93 million miles to the sun to 4.2 light years to the nearest star to the size of the Milky Way that some say holds hundreds of millions, billions of stars, just the Milky Way is a hundred light years wide. It would take us 3,700,000,000 years to travel across it in a space shuttle. From one end of the Milky Way, talk about a long beach trip. 3,700,000,000 years in a space shuttle. And that's just one galaxy. Here's another one. Evolutionists encounter a design dilemma for the long neck. We have trouble figuring out the long neck on a giraffe. The giraffe's heart is 20 pounds. It moves lots of blood. There's lots of circulation and has to be to get blood from the body of a giraffe all the way up to its head. So because of that, it has a higher blood pressure than many other animals. To get the blood all the way up there, there has to be a lot of pressure from this 20 pound heart pumping blood up to his brain. But what happens when he bends his head down to drink water and all the blood rushes to his head? The giraffe has a fragile brain. How does his brain not explode? They found that the capillaries and his brain has special linings around all of it. And when he bends his head down, his heart reduces some of the pressure 
and his veins and capillaries are designed to even hold it so when he bends his head down, his head doesn't explode. They can't figure out why that animal has that. It's oh, interesting stuff. They found that huh, in addition to the tight skin on the giraffe's legs, because of the extremely high blood pressure, it's been compared to an astronaut's suit. It prevents high blood pressure from coming straight out of the capillaries. Here's another one that gets argued a lot. Is it a day? Or is it a thousand years? Creation. We'll ask ourselves this. Was Jonah in the whale? Fish. 3,000 years? Look at verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. So you have creation and then you have man and your man saying, no, this is what creation looks like. It looks like this or that or this or that. This is what creation looks like. And it says that they became futile. Futile means empty in their thoughts. You see, we talk about often when you go to work, right? Going to work being boring and mundane and what? Empty? Unless you go to work with God. And then the same situation, we both could be in the same room. And one of us could be having, and from all perspectives, an empty day. But someone else in the same room right beside you could be on an adventure. And it depends what your perspective is on your relationship with God. If you deny God and that he created you and put you in the position, he put you in that room to do that work and gifted you to do it. If you deny the relationship with him, well, guess what? It is empty. It is boring. And it is nothing. But if you have a relationship with God... You're on a wonderful adventure to glorify him and reach others with the gospel. Praise the Lord. So, Jeremiah 2.5. Thus says the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me, this is God, that they have gone far from me. God is saying, what injustice have they found in me? What blemish, what shortcoming what unrighteousness have they found in me who made this for them? He goes on to say, Jeremiah 2, 5. That they've gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. Listen to this, Jeremiah 10, 12 to 15. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom, obviously wisdom, and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in heaven. And he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Everyone is dull-hearted, without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image. For his molded image is his falsehood. And there is no breath in them. They are futile, they are empty, a work of errors. That which we've made and our very best day, our very best creation has errors in it. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. He's saying, look, man, here's creation with no flaw. Look at it. It's been studied since it's been built from him, studied by us. And then he says, you make something. And on your best day, that which you've made is imperfect, and yet you worship that? Go back to Psalm 19, what we read a few minutes ago. 
we talked about, and I'm going to read the whole thing again. Listen to this. Psalm 19. The first part talks about creation, but I stopped intentionally. Watch what the next part says. Watch what God compares creation to. The beauty of creation. Think about it again. The best image that you've had, maybe the, the most beautiful place that you've ever been to, the most majestic beach, mountain, maybe it's just a countryside, whatever that, that most beautiful place you've been to is or, or thought about or seen. Listen to this, Psalm 19. For the choir director or Psalm of David, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the world and the world, excuse me, the words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. Reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy. Making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right. Bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Who wants insight for living, right? Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Listen, each one is fair. How many times in your workplace you're like, that's a bogus rule, or that's a, why are we doing that? Or what? Don't tell me you ain't said it, or heard it, or heard it. Right? And God is saying, there's no unfairness in my law. It's perfect. Listen, listen, it's good. They, God's commandments, listen, who, who likes gold, right? Who wants some gold, right? They are more desirable than gold. Even the finest gold. Young men. They are more desirable than gold. God's ways, God's commandments. It's not about the money. They are sweeter than honey. Even honey dripping from the comb. Listen to this. They are a warning to your servant. A great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? How can I know, how can I know all this stuff in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me, the psalmist cries out. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's been a prayer of mine. You know, because sometimes I can fake it till I make it on the outside. I can look like a pastor, but on the inside, whew. and so I've been asking God, like, God, please, may the, may the meditations of my heart, the depth of who I am, please, will you make it honoring to you? I was thinking about Pentecost. About a month ago, we had Pentecost, and, and we were up here, and we sang, many of you, Lord, Anything that's in the way of between what you want to do through me and what's going on in my life, please remove it. Right? I prayed that. I have a question. You don't have to raise your hand. Since that day that you prayed that, I'm, I'm guessing that the Lord has illuminated something that he would like to have from you. It, I prayed it. I was like, Lord, take anything and everything from my life that dishonors you or prevents me from reaching more people, from serving you to the max capacity that you want. I'll tell you something. He illuminated something in my life he didn't want. The question is, how did you respond? Did you give it to him? I'm not being anybody else. Let me ask you this. Let me ask it in a different way. 
Is your capacity the same to reach that it was before Pentecost? Or is there a deeper refiner's fire going on in your heart and you find yourself, wait a minute, God is using me in new ways lately. It's crazy. But instead, sometimes we say, unfortunately, all of us, me, I'd rather my sin lead instead of God. Now we're going to get to some good news. But this is reality. Verse 22. Verse 22. Here we go. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the, create, oh, excuse me, the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So it's called also a, a depraved mind. Let's talk about this. Sometimes in Christian circles, it likes to get pointed at more than other situations. Ooh, Romans 1, Romans 1, right? You ever done that? I have, I have. Rome, ooh, Romans 1, boy, right? That's where they're at, you know? We're missing the point. Listen to these verses. Hebrews 6, 7 to 8. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it's cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. If you plant something, and there's an intentionality about what you specifically planted, and it brings forth something completely different, something perhaps even detrimental to you or those around it, what are you going to do with that? It's not rocket science. Isaiah 122. Your silver has become waste matter. Your drink diluted with water. I don't know what you enjoyed. Maybe a good sweet tea in the south, right? Diluted with water. It's like, it's not what it's supposed to be, is it? And yet often that's what we do with ourselves. We're created for a purpose and we dilute ourselves. Proverbs 25.4. Take away the impurities from the silver, and there comes out a vessel for the smith. Listen to that. That's what we were just talking about. Take away the impurities from the silver, and there comes out a vessel for the smith. Is there anything that you're clinging to more than your king? I mean anything. Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, Jesus. But by their deeds, they deny him. Yeah, I love Jesus. Whoop, whoop. Jesus on Sunday. I'll let you on Friday. I'm, listen, I wasn't being disrespectful there. Every, uh, wasn't being disrespectful. Illustrating a point. They profess to know God, Titus 1.16, but by their deeds they deny him. Being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Oh man, we have so much to go. I'm going to go fast. Listen to this. This is a great quote. All right, you ready? The word deprived, depraved, deprived, depraved, depraved, comes from the root words, you ready for this? You're going you're to like this. 
comes from the root words alpha and accepted. Okay, listen. Aleph and dokimos. Okay, Greek. Aleph and dokimos. Listen, listen to this. You ready? In the ancient world, there was no banking system as we know it today. And there was no what? Paper money. Everything was silver. Okay. All money was made from metal, heated until liquid poured into molds allowed to cool. When the coins were cooled, it was necessary to smooth off the uneven edges. The coins were completely, uh, excuse me, were comparatively soft. And of course, many people shaved them closely because it was by weight. And you had silver, and after you got it out of the mold, it had rough edges, so you had to knock down the rough edges, so it would be, you know, not obtrusive, right? In one century, more than 80 laws were passed in Athens, Greece, to stop the practice of whittling down the coins in circulation. 80 laws were passed in Athens, Greece, to prevent the practice of whittling down the silver, taking just a little bit more silver off. But some money changers were men of integrity who would accept no counterfeit money. They were men of honor who put only genuine, full-weight money into circulation. Such men were called dokimos. And this is the word that's used here for the Christian as he is to be seen by the world. A man of integrity. A man who doesn't shave it down just a little bit. I'm just taking a little off the silver coin. This pops that sucker into circulation. And they would call the men who walked in it with integrity. Dokimos is where this, that's an interesting Greek word. But derived from the word alpha and accepted. Romans 8, 6 through 9. This is us. For the mind, before Jesus, for the mind is set, for the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, it does not subject itself to the law of God. It is not even able to do so. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. We like to talk about homosexuality being the worst. Lots of Christians do. We had an um, incident at work where we were pushing a, um, a hydraulic pump that, that bolts to the side of an engine on the excavator. Uh, the hydraulic pump is what circles all the hydraulic fluid to make all the functions happen, right? And uh, we were pushing it on a cart, and it fell off the cart and hit the floor, okay? And it damaged it enough to where we were unsure if the insides of the pump were, uh, if they'd been damaged or not as well. You can't see it. So we went ahead and scrapped the whole thing out. Very expensive. Very, very expensive. So my boss comes in. I have to take pictures. I have to write a long report. Why is the pump in the floor, okay? And one of the responsibilities I have is the root cause. What is the root cause of why the pump was in the floor? So while looking at the pictures, I noticed that the cart that was chosen to push the pump across the factory uh, to replace a, a pump that was bad on the machine, a machine on the line, it had a cutout on it for a, for a, to work on different types of parts that are out of process. So imagine a little plastic tool cart that maybe in a movie they put the, the chef puts the food on, right? Something like that. A little cart he pushes around. Chef has a beautiful... Uh, silver platter on there and he takes the lid off it's a cart like that but the cart on the top surface had a cutout on it and so in my report I put well there was a cutout on the cart I can't believe we chose that that cart you know obviously the pump's gonna fall off in the floor and my boss said that's not the root cause okay well, what's the root cause and uh he said well where were you going with the pump I was, like, I was going to a machine on the line that had a bad pump on it He's like, well, why was the pump bad on the machine on the excavator on the line? And I was like, because there was a bolt stripped off in the, in, the, in the pump, and the bolt broke off in it. And he was like, well, why was the bolt stripped out? 
and broken off in the pump. And I said, well, the technician was putting a bolt in it and it got seized up, and, you know, and the bolt broke off. And he said, did he tell anybody when the bolt got seized? I said, no. He said, that's your root cause. Somebody was doing something and they didn't call for help when they got in a bind. They stepped out of process. And that's why your pump is laying in the floor. So what we do is we look at homosexuality and it's like, oh gosh, you're the worst, you're the worst. That's not the root cause. Homosexuality is the symptom of a root cause. It's just where it ends up. Have you ever blacked out before? You know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about blacking out like that, Pastor Jim. I'm talking about blacking out like you know what I'm talking about. Did you intend at the beginning of that night to black out? I'm about, I'm about to have me a night, boys. No, you didn't, that wasn't the intent, was it? That's where you ended up. Because you started down this little social gathering in a cup. And you ended up black out. And the next day you're like, when someone tells you what you did. Did you, was your intent to go, I'm, gonna, I'm about to black out tonight, boy. We're about to have a fun one. No, that's not your intent. Nor is this little sticky note my intent to separate from me from God for eternity. I just, I just and God's like, you can't come with me forever. With the, I have to, de- I have to take that away. And we're like, oh, it's, we're be good, God. God's like, don't go down that road. It leads you into a dark place. We were founded as a Christian nation. We supported Israel. But now we are voting for leaders who support our sin. Listen to this. It just happens. It's it's normal. Look, it's, it's abnormally normal. It happens all the time. Listen, Ezekiel 16, 31 through 34. You erected your shrine at the head of every road. Listen, you built your high place in every street. You were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. You are an adulterous wife who takes, listen to this, who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payments to our harlots, but you made your payments to your lovers and hired them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot. In that you gave payment, but no payment was given to you. Therefore, you are the opposite. He's saying, look, you, not only were you practicing harlotry, but instead of people paying for your services, you paid and sought them out so you could be a harlot. This is n- not relect, uh, reflecting any current person in office right now, Okay. But how often do we want the boss in our job to be the one whom we know will let us get away with more? Well, he's too hard. I don't want to work for him. It's just a small example, and you can carry that example all the way into our country. Listen to this. Why did Sodom and Gomorrah get judged? We need to know this. Many of you know this. Why did Sodom and Gomorrah get judged? Was it because of homosexuality? No. That's not it. Listen, the Bible tells us. Ezekiel 16, you know this. 46 to 50, if you don't, it's important that you know this because it's a lot more relatable than what you think. Your elder sister is Samaria. So I'm at, he's talking to Jerusalem, divided into two, the, the nation of Israel, right? Samaria and Jerusalem, or some, you can say Israel and Jerusalem, or Judah and uh, Samaria, or Judah and Ephraim. But, okay, it's divided in two, and he's talking to Jerusalem. He says, your elder sister is Samaria, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you, and your younger sister, who dwells to the south of you, is Sodom and her daughters. You did not walk in their ways, nor act according to their abominations, but... You did. It says you did not walk in their ways nor act according to their abomination. But as if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. As I live, says the Lord, 
Neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity. Here it comes. This was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride. Fullness of food. And abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. It wasn't homosexuality, family. It was pride. They had everything they needed. They had a lot of pesos in their pocket. And they just sat around chilling. And God judged them. Homosexuality was just a progression of their initial sin. Listen to this. Getting drunk, committing adultery, stealing, what's the root cause? When you have a relationship with God, when you have, when you have a relationship with God, and you, we're having a good time, too much, we step across lines that are ungodly, what's the root cause? Pride. Leviticus 18, 22 to 30, and I'll speed up. You shall not sleep with the males. One sleeps with the female. It's abomination. But listen here. Watch what this says. Also, you shall not have sexual intercourse with any animal to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It's perversion. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all these things, the nations which I'm driving out from you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has vomited out its inhabitants. The people of the land were removed because they drifted so far from what Christ had called them to do. To the point you couldn't even tell what was going on anymore. And God's like, I got to deal with it. And he removed the people out of the land. Same thing that happened with Satan in the fall. Why did Satan get cast out of heaven? You can read it later, Ezekiel 28, 1 through 8. It's because he was like, well, I can be like God. He was beautiful. Satan was, I mean, Lucifer, Lucifer was absolutely beautiful. The Bible says it. He was amazing. He could sing. Likely the worship leader in heaven. Likely the worship leader in heaven, Lucifer was. And he's like, looking at God like, I can be like God. He got prideful and he was cast out. But I have a question for you. Is Eve the only one who ate the fruit? Or have we all eaten the fruit? Verse 28, let's begin to close. 28 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. Being filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Verse 31, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Everything that we just, goes, we just read goes back to verse 16. We start in verse 18. Everything we just read, the spiral, rejecting God, rejecting him as a creator, adding to that which he created, saying that that actually then is what it's supposed to be. Well, I'm suppressing the truth. This is what it's supposed to be. Actually, no, it's made like this. It's... I'm, I was made an alcoholic. I was made to 
do this thing or I was made something else. But everything goes back to verse 16. Go back to verse 16, Romans chapter 1. You might want to read it. This is a good tool in your tool bag for loving your neighbor. When sometimes you wonder, how do I reach out to my neighbor who's going through this or that? <laughs> Listen, verse 16, right? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by works. No. By how many people you help out in your neighborhood? That's how the just live? No. We are just because the just shall live by faith. We can take stuff off the picture this morning. We can clean the picture up. For the not yet born again, this is the offer that God wants to give you. He says, look, I know, I know. You've gotten caught up in some stuff. You, you also ate the fruit in the garden. And he says, look, I want to take it away and make you heal. I want to heal you. I want to make you whole. That's what God is saying. Look, he's saying this. This is what God's saying. Look. It's not that I want to beat you up or, or yell at you. That's not what God is saying to anybody in this room. Anybody listen. No, what he's saying is I want to take that which is hurting you away so you can be healed. Think about a father. What father wants to leave his child? We, a father wants to help. He wants to, however he can take away that which is hurting them. And, and, and let's not misconceive. And, and, and when you, God's going to open doors for you to have conversations. And this is what you say. He wants to heal you. So you can live with him forever. Starting right now, though. That's the gospel. But the only way is to have faith in Jesus. He died for you, and he is your savior. For someone not born again, taking these off is being forgiven of your sins and born again. It means God's spirit comes and lives in you. For the believer this morning, God is wanting and willing to forgive you and restore you once again so that you could be fully ready for the silversmith to do whatever he wants in you and through you listen to Romans 8 listen to Romans 8 you're going to like it listen to how it's written you ready it's past tense Romans 8, the, the passage that we all, all, all things work together for good to those who love God, right? All things work together. We in the workplace, something goes on, we're like, all things work together. But watch, it's even better than that. 28, verse 32. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those him, whom he foreknew, listen, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Listen, listen. And these, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? 
If God is for us, who is against us? Who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all? How will he not also with him freely give us all things? If you put your trust in Jesus' family today, if you, put your, if you say, all right, I recognize I, I've gotten, I've ca- caught up in some things. I've preferred those things more than God. I recognize that I need healing. I want a relationship with God because as, as much as I try and tell you that these things look good on me and in my life, in the depth of my heart, I know I'm really wrestling. I want Jesus to heal me from those things. I want God to remove those things. He cleanse me, make me white as snow, and I can have a relationship with him. And every day when I get up, it's not empty at all. And I don't have to do that, which I've done because I was trying to fill the emptiness and make it more spicy. But he is that which we long for. And when you, when you ask that, when you, when, you, when you tell God that, when you receive his forgiveness through what Jesus did for you on the cross, he sees you as already finished. In other words, listen, this week I got up and I made a couple mistakes. Imagine that. And so... I tell you this for relatability, right? So I get up, I, one of the two, get up, I was either getting up or going to sleep, get on my knees by my bed and feel like I couldn't even talk to God. And God said, son, that's not it. You are mine. Ask for forgiveness. It's already been paid for. I already paid the price. Just, Ask for forgiveness and you'll be forgiven. You are my child. Come boldly to my throne. What's stopping you from coming boldly to his throne this morning? Wouldn't you rather, instead of trying to put all your effort and energy into trying to get that out of your life, wouldn't you rather by faith believe that he'll take it and you can come boldly into his throne? So 1 Kings... 19, 11 through 12. Then the Lord said, go out to Elijah. Go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Sometimes we carry around these book bags. We got all this stuff in there. And, and, and we're carrying these things around. God's like, will you let me have that? Why are you carrying that around? Think of it like this. I should have brought my book bag up here. Sean, you're right. But I like the stuff in my book bag. And God's like, yeah, it's not honoring to me. It's so hard. And the Lord's like, how about thinking about it like this? Instead of thinking selfishly about you having to give it up, perhaps thinking about it that I'm taking stuff out of the book bag so that I can send you through places you can't currently go while you have it on. God, I want to be used in my workplace. I want to be used wherever you send me. He says, yay. Well, let me take that which is stopping you from doing all that which I want to do through you. So you can fit into those places I'm sending you. So I'll chunk my book bag as far away as I can throw it. And I say that with this, I understand. We understand how hard it is. So it comes back to faith. 
place more emphasis in God dealing with it for you than you trying to deal with it to get right with God. So this morning as we sing, what's God saying to you in the still small voice? Will he say, will you trust me with your life? Is that what he's saying? Will you receive the forgiveness of your sins? Is he saying, let me have that? Whatever it is this morning, there's the word. I pray that you would respond. And let's pray about it together after he finishes singing. Lord, uh, thank you. You don't even have to do this for us. But you left heaven where there was nothing wrong, where everything was perfect, and you sent your son. 
here. To pay the punishment for everything we've ever done wrong to dishonor you. You took the punishment by sending your son to redeem us. To pay the debt that we could not pay. A debt you did not owe because you loved us so much. I don't know what that still small voice is saying to each one of us, Father. But I pray that we would live by faith and trust you with it. If you want a relationship with the Lord, if you want to give him your life and receive the forgiveness of your sins, there's no better moment than this moment right here. If you'd like to do that, tell him. It's, not, it's nothing, you don't have to stand on one leg or just tell him. If you lack the words to say, perhaps you tell him like this right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me and paying the price for my sin. Thank you for the invitation to set me free from all that bondage. I put my trust in you, Jesus. Please forgive me of my sin. Come live in my heart. I give myself to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Lord, uh, thank you for this opportunity this morning to gather. Lord, uh, thank you for um, your word. Lord, that, that encourages us in the midst of our biggest battles. You have a solution. If today you gave your life to the Lord for the first time, I ask the elders to raise their hand, if you could, wherever you're at. Just look around the room if, you, if there's elders. And these elders are, thank you. These elders are available to you. If you didn't see who raised their hand, you can ask your neighbor beside you when we close. If you have more questions, if you need more information, if you want to know how to get plugged in, if you want to know how to follow Jesus, these, men's, these men have committed their lives to follow him, and help others do the same. So I would encourage you strongly. Introduce yourself to them. Get to know them. And allow them to help you get to know Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his countenance overshadow and surround you wherever you go. May you know his peace peace of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for your patience and uh, we pray you have a blessed week in the Lord.